All right? And I wired for sound. <laughs> well, we have a very curious subject today. It's not much talked about, but I think it is worth a lot of thinking. As you probably realize, uh, at the time of Muhammad in the Arabian area, uh, histories and documents were pretty solidly established. And in the Meccan area where he lived, he was known to many people during his own lifetime. And he was known as a brilliant thinker, a dedicated man, and an astute businessman. And among the things that did not get in the Koran are a number of statements that he made to his friends and associates. And one of them has bearing upon the thought we have today. So it is said there that, so saith the prophet, upon whose name be peace. If I had two cloaks, I would sell one and buy hyacinths for my soul. This doesn't sound like the Muslim thinking of today, but it was part of a system we find in Neoplatonism and in most of the ancient beliefs, a tremendous emphasis upon beauty the ministry of beauty in the life of the human being. The soul is often represented as a tired figure in a prison cell, looking out through the wood bars of the windows, something like ribbons perhaps, upon a larger world, but imprisoned within the small compass of the physical body. The soul in the body becomes an important factor in the philosophy of Neoplatonism the soul within the body peering out to see the reflection of itself in the world is a very beautiful picture and a very beautiful simile. Now the world's search for beauty and the soul's quest of it in itself is part of a very interesting and important tradition. Actually, it is part of early Christian mysticism and we remember that uh, Dante, who was a troubadour, a trouvier, meaning a priest, not a harlequin. Uh, he was a very deep-thinking man in mysticism, but whenever he saw a bright and beautiful rose, he knelt and wept. Dante weeping over the rose was a reminder to him that the white rose was made red by the blood of his Savior. And mysticism and symbolism and strange beliefs form a very beautiful structure around which to study the mystery of the human soul. For this morning we're going to take it in the idea of a part of beauty. The soul is a symbol of beauty. The soul is the eternal beauty in the world in man. The soul is the symbol of harmony, of peace, of beauty, of truth, of love and it is imprisoned within a body with many strange personality defects. It is partly covered by a body that is full of hates and of shames and of miseries. This wonderful thing within, the locked beauty that is continually seeking to release itself, is one of the great mysteries of mysticism. Now we find looking around us many interesting examples and thoughts concerning this subject. In the first place, today, in our modern world, we are short of beauty, very short of it, because beauty is not measured in terms of skyscrapers, it is not measured in terms of office buildings or of aeroplanes, although we sometimes say that is a beautiful plane. This wouldn't really be quite true because beauty wouldn't build a war plane. It means perhaps we have a symmetrical body there. We have a harmonious structure of parts, but we have no beauty unless the use is beautiful. Everything in nature is either working toward beauty or against it. And all that works for it builds. All that works against it tears down. So we're going to talk a little bit about some of these things today as possibilities in the lives of individuals. We are constantly searching for something to do, to help, 
either ourselves or others or both. And I think we should look very carefully into the quest for beauty and how this can come nearer and nearer to our own daily life. We know, for instance, that everyone would like to live a happy life, would like to live a life filled with beauty and truth. But in the world around us, there is a tremendous emphasis upon the asymmetrical, upon the negative and the destructive. We have gradually profaned the arts, which were the great instruments of beauty. For all that is beautiful in nature is summarized in the arts and the structures that by which these are developed and perfected. We have the development of music, by means of which we have the great symphonies, the great ministerial systems of uh, Haydn and uh, Bach and all the other great artists. And then we have the where is music today? Hard rock. Something has happened. Music has been profaned. Music that was intended to give us something, to make us better, it was to bring us to our knees in the cathedral, that was to bring us to our feet in the glory of nature. All of a sudden, this magnificent universal mystery turns upon us and gives us distortion, gives us ugliness, gives us a profane factor, and that which was created to sound through the altars of glory suddenly becomes part of a hard, cynical, disillusioned social structure. What has happened to this? It is part of the general disillusionment that has crept over the world. And wherever this has happened, we have had a destruction of beauty. We have profaned the divine spirit as it dwells in us and seeks to manifest itself in the seeking world in which we live. Therefore, we can say, could we do something to redeem this beauty? Could we do something to redeem sound? Could we lift it up out of this terrible slough in which it now exists and begin once more to understand its real meaning? Would it help in some way to bring a better civilization to us? if we had better concepts of the effect of sound upon the psychic structure of the human being. Psychologists are already studying this, not as a mystic uh, phenomena, but as simply as mental phenomena. They are beginning to realize that all asymmetrical sounds are dangerous. We talk about the dangers of a bacterial infection, but we have just as great danger from sound infections. We have all kinds of dissonances which have a tendency to reduce our health, to lower our morals, to corrupt our homes, and to pervert our children. All these beautiful things we have in life, when they become turned into ill, become dangerous, for be, because under every one of the little flowers of beauty there is a, serp a poison serpent if we pervert that beauty into something that shouldn't be there. So we have now something we can think about perhaps a little bit. Most people are getting tired of television. Well, television is part of beauty. Television is part of the soul's liberation. It is an instrument to release into the life of the individual all the wonders of the known world and to help to explore the unknown world. But what do we have? An incessant parade of advertisements. We have constant emphasis upon more or less negative and corrupted social conditions. We have the glorification of that which can never be glorious, and we have neglected actually and forever that which was internally and eternally glorious. So here's a case where the individual can't really change the structure of entertainment, but he can change his own relationship to it. He can de decide in his own mind that he is not going to drift along with these things simply because they're cheap entertainment. He's going to realize that if he has to kill time, there are more painless ways of doing it than through <laughs> the corruption of sounds. So here we have something happening, however. In Europe now and in many parts of this country, a gradually increasing interest in good music. We also begin to think in terms that we, we forgot 50 years ago the children can be taught music. 
that there can be music in the family and music in the home and that we do not have to depend upon this endless prostitution of sounds which we call life as it is today so we can start it ourselves if we, li- if we don't want to try to learn to play an instrument we can learn to understand and appreciate good music we can get music tapes of the great masterpieces of all time and play them we can turn our minds and our eyes from the terrible, dismal, the perversion of humor that we see so much and feel within ourselves the release of this imprisoned something which is seeking constantly to be beautiful in the presence of that which is not beautiful. So each person can rescue something of sound by changing his own relationships with it. He can find ways of learning all kinds of things. Instead of listening hour after hour to assorted commercials, he can get a little instrument of some kind and try to learn to play it. True, he probably will never be a virtuoso or anything of that kind. He'll never be great. But he can have pleasure. And I know people with uh, little instruments, which they can only play painfully, not only painful for them, but others have to hear it. Uh, But... Out, and most of their friends are happy even though they have a tendency to shudder a little because the person is trying to do something rather than sit back and let something that isn't good be done to him and this is part of the way we have to rescue the values of true beauty we have to rest them, rescue them from the corruption of in commercialism and a gradually lowering threshold of emotional appetites. We have to do things better in order to find out how it should really be done. Now in the period of sound we have many things today. The sounds of traffic, the sounds of engines, the sounds of machinery. All of these things do nothing to help this very sensitive thing within ourselves. It is looking to hear the sound of beauty and never hears it. We can make it hear it however there is possibility of restoring part of the simple healthiness of uniting in a charming experience of some nature or degree. When I was growing up, most families had an old piano. I remember the old Sears and Robot catalog used to advertise a standing piano delivered to you for $25. <laughs> Brand new. But everybody had something. The grandparents probably were a little bit suffering from rheumatism but they could still finger out some of the old hymns and some of the songs and uh, pieces that they had learned in their own youth the family gathered around and did it together they worked together to make some kind of a beauty usually under the general name of religion the old hymns were very much favored in those days and the children uh, sang them right along with the adults there was a sense of simple pleasure without extravagance, without complications, uh, without doctrinal differences, just family as it should be. Folks who loved each other and enjoyed working together. All this is disappearing, but it is beginning to come back because the other phase, this misuse, has failed so miserably that there are few people that can stand it any longer. Now, in the field of music also, now we have in art a music therapy. We have all kinds of opportunities to improve our understanding of music. Right after World War II, uh, a a gentleman who was connected with one of the large broadcasting stations, and I worked out a program for therapeutic music to be used in in mental and uh, military hospitals for those whose hearts had been broken, whose souls had been damaged by the ravages of war. It was a very nice program. It could have been a very good thing, but it never got any further than office music in business houses. Because actually no one wanted to do it. No one believed that it was necessary that a sick person hear something that refreshed his soul. First of all, they didn't believe in the soul and there were so many people if some of them didn't get well so what this was the principle upon which it was all based we were unable to accomplish what we wanted to accomplish but still it was a good try 
and today it will probably be revived under hermetic therapy, which is coming fast. Out of the din and confusion of noise, which is a jarring upon the heart, the mind, and the body, is going to come the soothing power of harmony, melodic line, and the restoration of the great masterpieces which we have all known and have now generally neglected. This is one of the advantages of religion. The religious music, the attention of the mind upon music, the Gregorian chants, the beauties of the Mass, and these things were far more important than the doctrinal teaching. They brought the individual into the realization that when he entered the house of God, he entered a place of peace. He entered a place of beauty. He entered something he could listen to and rejoice and relax and forget for a moment the pressures of life. And this type of satisfaction was one of the secrets of theology for many hundreds of years. Now we got another type of thing here also under the mystery of sound. And that is how can we uh, insulate the person against the sounds of death the sounds of darkness, corruption, uh, the whistling of the police signals, fire signals, the constant arrest and persecution or prosecution of people. How are we going to do something to make the soul in ourselves glad? We constantly object to these terrible things that are happening, but it never occurs to us that we can do anything about it. Well, there are many parts of it that we can't change as individuals. But there is no part that we cannot change in ourselves and do something that is going to be a little more glorious and a little more gracious. We can refrain from joining in any way the assembly of the discontented. Now, we can be aware of mistakes. We can regret the problems that arise. We can wish they didn't come. But we cannot take negative attitudes of hate and disillusionment and disgust over things that we should meet with understanding and insight. Because the more we hate, the more the soul languishes in the prison of the body. The more we are disillusioned and go about frustrated, neurotic, the more we destroy the freedom and power of the soul within ourselves. In other words, we, when we don't have the proper nourishment, the body begins to give trouble. When we do not feed the soul with beauty, the soul gives trouble. It gives it because it is sick. And it is sick and tired of hating. It is sick and tired of suspecting. It is sick and tired of carrying gossip and scandal and slander. It is sick, sick and tired of all the international police, police and intrigues that come with crime and with all the departments of our present jurisdiction. We are looking for that quietude that represents peace. There is no way we can find it until we release it inside of ourselves. We can go all over the world today, but we will find no peace in the outer world. The peace is always within. But if it is strong enough within, it will transmute the outside. And that is why we have to work as if industriously and as conscientiously as we can. So we go on through various sounds and phases of sound to find out what we can do to make all sounds beautiful and make all dissonant sounds turn around and become better. We have found many ways of increasing uh, the development of machinery so that it is less uh, hard and harsh in its sounds. But even if it can't do anything about that, we may have to work all day into the pressure of man-made sound. But somewhere in the day or somewhere in the year, we must have contact with God-made silence. We have to come in contact with the realities. We live in a world of illusion. Noise is illusion. Money is illusion. Power is illusion. All the ambitions of mortals are illusions. And beneath them all and behind them all is the quietude of the divine way, the things we ought to all be thinking about to the very best of our ability. Now, the next thing we might consider as an art in the study of the beautiful is artistry in the form of painting, sculpturing, and uh, illustrations of various kinds. 
we have had in the history of mankind some magnificent artists and it is very nice to realize that most of these are remembered and that there is a great determination to keep good things from disappearing from among us but every great war destroys a mass of greatness it tears down great structures that were centuries in the building it destroys the wonderful architectural genius of some of the greatest minds that ever followed the mysteries of Euclid in the study of mathematics many of the great buildings were designed by Pythagoreans others the great cities of Rome and others Florence were done by Vitruvian architects these buildings were masterpieces of mathematics and they were all built with one particular point in mind peace now this is something it's probably with no one paying attention to no one paying attention to whether a building was peaceful or not they might wish it if it sounds good when they get into it or something but they don't pay much attention to those things anymore but the builders of those great structures that we have torn down did believe those things and we have put in the place buildings of concrete and steel that have no soul and never will have any no greatness was behind them no goodness inspired them no hope fulfilled their building now they are simply reservoirs for commerce they are places where people continue to swarm to make a living but no one learns how to make a life therefore these things again have to be thought about it is said that Pythagoras wandering down the streets of one of the cities of Greece uh, we carried with him a lute which was a small harp like instrument and every time he formed saw a building he struck the keynote of that building on his, on his musical instrument and every one of the principal buildings of his day were keyed to some mathematical musical formula everything had meaning everything was not only done to make it beautiful but to make it appeal or reveal the divine purpose it was something that each building was a tribute to the divine architect who builds all things no one would think of building contrary to the will of God and it's not little different now when nobody really believes or very few believe in the will of God at all it's only when suffering comes and sorrow closes in that we begin to think about these things but we know that in antiquity and in all parts of the world there are magnificent buildings that are entitled to be termed beautiful they are beautiful not only because of their structure but because of the reason for them they're there because they stand as a symbol of defense standing strong to keep beauty alive in the world to keep us constantly aware of the dignity of life we need this always every day and it is very important that each person comes in time to understand a little of this so that in his daily life uh, he can begin to apply it now we can go down to another step and that is our homes we all have some feelings on the matter of home uh, but the feelings are very scattered and uh, I don't think that we can say generally speaking that the average home is a work of art or a monument to beauty for the most part it is gathered together according to the passing likes and dislikes of people if the individual who owns the home is fond of sports it's apt to be decorated with sporting instruments if the individual is simply just living there it will be whatever he can accumulate will go there some of it comes from the past others are accumulated as we go but in the main homes are not made into mathematical psychological or mystical compounds for the improvement or regeneration of the individual a home is a tremendous opportunity for soul in this home there is a certain privacy we are not open to the criticism of everybody and in the home we have a certain mastery of the situation and if we can agree a little bit on something we can make the home a place of peace where the soul can express itself in its normal way we can do things that make the home a thing of natural peace but we've lost the idea we've lost the principle of it now I know that uh, uh, high art and things of that nature are probably a little too abstract for the present general purpose 
But I think we should realize that we are now being inundated, actually inundated with art. Everything you can think of is selling some kind of a gadget or a gigol that is intended to be artistic. Some of it is very good. Some of it is really very artistic. But almost all of these things have something about them that is kind of negative because nearly all of them are made for a mass market to sell as many as possible. The idea of the making was not to release the, the power of life. It was to en enhance the profits in the bank account. These things are therefore symbols of something better that have lost its, their souls into something not as good. Well, one of the examples of this, of course, is the endless problem of reproductions. Here we can buy very nice reproductions of paintings, sculpturings, antiques, and everything else, but the vibration isn't there. All these things that were done with great love had love in them had something so deeper to bring to the purchaser, something to live with, something to share in an experience. This is mostly gone. We have now fine chromo reproductions in gilded frames, but they're all printed for so much a hundred. There is thus no longer the wonderful work of art in which the individual reaching out wants something because his soul is hungry for it and will not give in and not give up until he attains it. This is one of the problems in art, that we need to have people who love art well enough to sacrifice once in a while uh, a dinner at an extensive restaurant or some actual superficial uh, attainment which has no lasting meaning. Every home should have within it one example of art. One thing that is a pure case of beauty. Something that brings beauty as a symbol into the life of people. And no thing that is reproduced in wholesale lots and hung up by thousands of people who never pay much attention to it anyway. This is not art. This is not the thing we are looking for. And yet it's a mistake to assume that every time you think of art, you have to think of Rembrandt or uh, Van Gogh or something of this kind. It's, if you think of both Rembrandt and Van Gogh at the same time, there's that to be minor struggle of same nature within yourself. Because actually, Rembrandt was a great artist. Van Gogh was a person internally deeply troubled a person who had some artistic skills, a frustrated person who would like to have lived better, but didn't. And as a result of that, strangely enough, in everything he did, there is a kind of pathetic failure. Something that left a feeling that he thought it was really rather beautiful. But, and the but was the fact that the beauty that he tried to draw was never supported by the beauty within himself which could not come out. So everywhere things have to come out and in all arts there has to be a release and probably the greatest release we know is the found in the time when art was most appreciated. We have the wonderful work of Leonardo, we have the magnificent sculpturings of Michelangelo, we have all the glories and marvels of Dura and Botticelli all these great artists. Now, what was the difference between those artists and the ones we have today? What was the quick decision of difference? Well, it's pretty obvious if we read back. Those great artists all lived in a generation that most people believed in God. Whereas it gets less and less of a belief in the divine, the art becomes more and more cynical, more and more critical, more and more superficial, and more and more created simply for exploitation. In, without ideals, without traditional backgrounds of some kind, without sincere integrities, great art cannot come to the world. And without a little measure of this, just a little measure, 
great art cannot come into our homes. Now we don't expect anybody to buy and own a Michelangelo and it's much better that he doesn't because if he couldn't take care of it even. If it was if it came an earthquake or a fire or something, a priceless treasure would be lost. Only public institutions have facilities to protect these things even to a measure. But somewhere lurking among the interesting facts of life, there is something, something that each individual could own that is real. It would not mean a great expenditure, but it would bring with it to, into life the integrities, the ideals of a sincere type of honesty. Now, we are, uh, late, lately, you know, I was so many years, I went down to the Indian reservations in New Mexico and Arizona, and there the, you see the what they call the pawns. A pawn was something, an Indian pawn to get money with, and very often never reclaimed because he never got enough money to get buy it back. But a pawn was a fine piece of native work made for a native, done in a native way, with all the simple integrity of a pure and natural gift. And these pawns today are priceless. On the other hand, there is an epidemic, a deluge, of magnificent Indian jewelry, made with all the most beautiful skill you can imagine and suited to the sophisticated tastes of our modern non-Indian. But to the real lover of the values of life, these new things are business. The old ones were faith. We did not need to have them so perfect. The soul was in them. Each thing was done with loving thought and care. Today, machinery takes over. Various factories are making much better quality but not soul. Soul does not come that way. So you think there's something you can always have. You can find them in some junk shop or in some place a little token that comes from a real background of integrities. Something that was done for the reason that it was necessary or appropriate to the needs. That is one of the reasons why religious art of all different nations is interesting. It is because if it is genuine, it is made in terms of love or piety. It is done on purpose as an offering upon the altar of something greater than ourselves. That which was intended for the gods is going to be more beautiful than the thing that was intended for sale. So all along the line, we watch for the symbols of integrities in things, that they bring with them not only the size and the dimensions of the object, but the auras, the magnetic fields, the intensities of a, de of a dedication, of a devotion, and very often to this is added a long history of trouble and strife and sorrow until it finally comes to the keeping of a person who really understands. So it is nice to have things of this nature to live with. It is nice to be able to look at a mantelpiece and find something that is a doorway to a larger life, doorway to a greater world of things. And it is very important that it not be a substitution, that it not be a copy, because souls are not, not done in copies. The souls are each individual. And the little soul touch in an image, or in a little picture, or in a page of, of writing, all these things become original contributions to, to beauty to the joys and rightnesses of things that we need so badly today. And of course, most of all, if an individual can develop a skill, even if it is a homely skill, if he can do something to express beauty from himself, out of his own need, out of his own desperate seeking, it is very wonderful. Because some little thing that would be probably as a finished product, nothing to brag about, would still be a tremendous achievement to a person for whose life that little thing opened the door of the soul. These are the things to think about. Let beauty come forth. Let the joy of creating take over this constant process of copying and facsimiling and making modern things that are not very good. So there we have another phase of art. 
Now another phase we have to face, I think that probably most people are not fully aware of at the present time, is the effect of soul upon the person themselves. Now it's not good to think of the soul within the individual as dwelling in a tenement. It is not good that it should be something that we wouldn't even want to know. We would not want to be our be so in our soul that we wouldn't want the soul to come in the front door. We would not it to be want it to be obscured, to be cluttered, and to be desecrated. In other words, when the individual profanes his own house, then something happens that's not good. And when he does to his own hut house what the enemy does to the church when he takes it over and destroys it then we realize that the soul locked within has to suffer from the habits of the body it has to take on the cocaine and the and the uh, marijuana and all these things it has to take on the bad habits the bad thoughts the corrupt morals and that self within simply sudden and slowly dies it doesn't actually die, of course, but it dies out of that body and waits for a better chance. But everywhere there is an opportunity for the individual to make his own life an adequate symbol of his integrity. It is possible for him to build something that he would be proud to know. And when the soul comes to see him, it will not be weeping. It will not be ill and dying from neglect but will come beautified by the fact that the individual has created within his own life a place of dignity and honor for that which is worthy of dignity and honor instead of corrupting too much of it for vanity. So we might must have something to help the soul to come out. And uh, Pythagoras tells us a little bit about that also. He tells us all about what music is. And he tells us a little bit about how the universal music, the wonders of the music of the spheres, and how all these things happen. That sound is a magnificent mystery, and that all pure sound in its combinations and re reactions is beautiful. Mu sound is divine. It is the actual voice of angels. And as the Gaita says in the introduction to Faust, the, the angels chanted their songs among the stars. It is actually true that all these things are in themselves beautiful and it is only because of the human being's failure to be beautiful that he has gradually dragged down uh, the wonders of life to something that's not so wonderful. It's like a family which has a child and the family gradually fails away from, from integrity and drags the child with it so that the whole life is ruined because the mind has been captured by some excess or degeneration. These things all have to be considered. Now Pythagoras was the one who developed the diatonic scale in about 600 BC. Up to that time, uh, all music in, in, in the Grecian states uh, was, maybe we might say, uh, amateur. Every individual who sang, sang to the pleasure of his own pitch. And there was no such a thing as a chorus, because what was a chorus then we wouldn't recognize, because everyone would be singing according to his own pitch, and the harmony would not be exactly great. But it had one advantage, it was honest. Each individual meant exactly what he did, and it was better to do a poor job as an original than to get harmonized with many others under some kind of outside pressure or, uh, or demand. So in the, uh, in the Pythagorean system, he discovered the thread, Monocordia Mundi, the thread that united heaven and earth, that between the stars and the very ground beneath our feet, there is a great mass of sound divided into a double octave. And the octaves, uh, the two parts, meet at the orbit of the sun and the lower octave is built from the surface of the sun to the surface of the earth and the higher octave 
is from the upper surface of the sun to the outside surface, uh, surface of Saturn. These two dividing the marks kept represented a tremendous harmonic problem. Now Pythagoras discovered the problem, but what could he do about it? He had nothing to work with in that line. The Egyptians had a musical system. The Hindus had a musical system. In India it is the Veena, which is a perfect mathematical symbol, a perfect harmony based upon a perfect integrity of sound and interval. In other words, there is no discord. The moment there is no discord, there is harmony. The moment this discord comes in, harmony ceases. Now occasionally the anharmonic line, as it is used by Wagner, was very important to the development of harmony because it represented the struggle of the soul to achieve harmony. But in the Pythagorean system, the whole universe and man's solar system was one vast harmony, one tremendous concerti, one tremendous sacred peace of harmony, of glory, and of spiritual strength. And in this harmony, all things live together. Now, many times, we know that this harmony lived in music. We know that some of the most beautiful music was done in a very simple way, by a simple instrument, by simple people. But on the other hand, there was also great technical skill, a tremendous development of sounds and intervals. And in such instruments as the vena, the violin, and uh, the uh, Japanese uh, arcota, we have the basic development of the strings. Years ago, I made a series of experiments with the coda because it was the only thing available now in the world without very, very difficult problems of getting foreign instruments. The coda was a long instrument with strings sufficiently long so that they could be arranged by means of frets into the double octave. And by means of that, we were able to set up the musical solar system and so and explain how and why all these things worked the way they did and Pythagoras was, he was the one who should have all the credit for the basic principles involved but he suddenly discovered the universe of sound he discovered the fact that if there was one dissonance in the great musical system the universe would fail everything had to be according to rule and according to law but in the great plan of things, there was nothing to disobey. There was nothing to break the rules. It remained for man to attempt to reshape these rules to his own privileges. And it was then that the great troubles began. Pythagoras was one who took these rules and he used them very carefully. And he made a very definite effort to create a music therapy and a music consciousness he would, uh, found that he could control nearly anything at all that needed control by means of music. One of his disciples on a certain occasion was at a feast in a house of a great man among the Grecians. And in the midst of the feast, this great man who was a judge came very close to losing his life. The son of a criminal whom he had condemned to death came into the banquet uh, armed with a bow and arrow uh, to kill the man who had penalized or condemned his father. And as he drew the, the arrow to shoot the helpless legislator who had, could not escape in time, the Pythagorean leaned over and because it was a banquet, there was a small harp lying near. Uh, and he struck a chord on the harp. Instantly, the would-be assassin was glued to the spot. He couldn't move. He couldn't draw back the bow. He couldn't release the arrow. And he remained that way until the legislator left the assembly. And then he went home. A little less dramatic, but certainly more human, is another story that protected in the Pythagorean uh, annals. And that is the young man who was deeply in love. And as a result of that was not very happy when the light of his life jilted him. In this great emergency, he decided to burn down her house, which was 
uh, the only thing that he could do on the haste. And as one of the Pythagoreans happened to wander by while he was piling up the kindling to burn the house, and I asked him what he was doing. He said he was burning down the house because the girl had visited him. The man again struck the instrument that he was carrying. And the boy stopped, the young man stopped. And they played a little harmonic chord on the instrument. And the young man picked up the kindling and put it away. And he said, now he understood better. And he forgave her and all was well. So sound was very important to these things. And it was always important. And uh, in Athens, every architect in the old days was required by law to prove that any building that he planned would not be a detriment to the state. It had nothing to do with how much it cost or how beautiful it was. It was if you look upon it, do you grow or do you cringe? Does it give you something to make your soul happy or does it something to offend your soul? Any architect who built a structure that would offend souls lost his citizenship and was exiled from the state. We don't do things like that, you know. And maybe because we have these masses of conflicts, masses of chaos, masses of unmatched and unmattered art and architecture, we're in the trouble that we're in. Because we simply do not pay any attention to the effect of our environment upon ourselves. We think if we can get everybody into a house or get all the children into school, we have it made. But unless we put them in a house that is worthy of them and put them in from this school to a better one, nothing is actually solved. So all in, the, all, in all in all, beauty continues to be very important in our daily living. It is something that we all could, must consider to be an aspect of the divine nature. Now we can go into beauty to some other aspects of life. We can go into beauty as it affects upon our personal relations and our personal integrities with each other. We can also go into the problem of nutrition. The nutrition is an art, and it is beautiful, the individual is well. If it isn't beautiful, he is sick. If he abuses his own body, he will suffer. If he perverts the lives of others, he will be penalized. All in all, beauty must have its final victory. Now, how are you going to find, uh, for average persons, something that might help to make this victory reasonable? Well, I think the ancients all agree on one thing, that the most perfect example of the divine plan that we can contemplate is the very world we live in. The earth with all its glories and all its beauties is the wonder of wonders. No artist can ever make the equal. No great magician can ever bring about the miracle of life. We are constantly surrounded by evidences of a wonderful carefulness, a wonderful integrity, and a magnificent fulfillment of the purpose for which life is fashioned. So if we are observing, we can find beauty in nature. Perhaps in a vacation, we can do a hike into the hills. Perhaps we can go out for a little while simply and sit in a garden and watch the wonders of a handful of plants that have survived all the terrors and tyrannies of mankind. We can also watch and see how harmless things become the basis of great courage and great insights and great improvements. We can also observe the terror that comes from destroying life. We can take a little garden that's not over ten feet square and in it we can build a universe and we can make this a horrible place like an inferno or we can make it a beautiful place where a few little sacred lives are able to fulfill their destinies. Everywhere there is a possibility of a very quiet, beautiful, charming acceptance of the challenge of the soul that all things should be better. Now we have souls, we must realize that bodies uh, have certain proximate relationships but that souls, and without being in such relationships, are really closer to each other than bodies can ever be. For actually the soul is the point of junction between. Unless the soul blesses a friendship, that friendship will not live. And that friendship cannot survive the corruptions 
of the various aspects of consciousness. It cannot survive too much selfishness, too much discord, too much deceit. Little by little, the mistakes we make take away from us the kinship with that part of ourselves which is in another body. One of the Greeks referred to a friend of his as himself in, a, in another flesh. And this is the idea almost. Because if things are done perfectly, or done nobly, or, the, or ideals are preserved, friendships become eternal. And the famous friendship of Damon and Pythias is probably one of the great stories of life. There used to be an order of the Knights of Pythias in which this was dramatized as a part of a, a modern social benevolent organization. But in the story of Damon and Pythias, uh, one man stood prostrate to the other. The other man went, had to go home to take care of something. They had both been sentenced to death. And the one who had to go was released only on the grounds that the other one would stay. And if the first one never came back, the second one would be executed. It looked for a while as though the execution of the second man was inevitable. But on the very day when he was being prepared for death, the first man came back and took on the burden he promised, as he had promised. And the ruler of the country was so impressed by this act that he forgave them both. This is the type of thing that, again, is an evidence of something inside of us. Something, the story goes on and on and on, of there being something inside that is very important. The Oriental mind also believes that there's something inside of other kingdoms that can be brought into harmony with man. That, the, uh, that all animals, if they are properly tended, will gra gradually verge towards harmlessness. And that practically all animals have the possibility of psychic communion with human beings. And that all this, all the animal it does is grow from the contact. Whereas very often the human being fails because of that contact. It's easy enough for the animal to grow under proper conditions, but it is hard to prevent the human being from destroying animals. <clears throat> so we have all these different things to think about. But out of it all comes the one major consideration that each of us has locked within himself the possibility of eternal friendship with all that lives. Also, a, a relationship by which there is always a brotherhood of existence, that things are never really separated except by appearance. But the real separations we suffer from are the selfishness, the bigotries, and the self-centeredness that we develop in our journey through life. Therefore, if we are going to try now, as we should all be doing, to live better, have a more normal and better, more kindly relationship, we can start now. Now the beauty also goes into another phase and that is <clears throat> the beauty that comes from the creation of life. The most, most important moment probably in the experience of beauty is a mother holding in her arms a newborn babe. For her at that moment the soul is open. For that moment, all else is forgotten in a simple affection. As time goes on, this may wear off. As the child grows, it may develop strange tendencies that are not pleasant to the mother. But in that moment of birth, a new life comes in. And in that new life, there is a kindred between the soul in that mother and the dawning soul in that child. So every mother has at least once in a lifetime, if she has children, an experience of what you might term the experience of pure harmony and beauty. The little one is beauty. And at that time, none of its faults and failings will be noticed. None of the limitations it brings will be cared about. In those moments, life and life meet in the experience of a magnificent friendship a fraternity deeper than anything else that can occur in life. So there is the opportunity for every woman to know the meaning of actual uh, beauty. A beauty that has nothing to do with the physical form primarily, 
but is a meeting of souls one with the responsibility of caring for the other and this responsibility becomes the greatest privilege of all this greater this is the one thing that makes the life otherwise sterile suddenly fruitful of all good so these things we have to watch all the time for everywhere there is beauty and this beauty we must all learn to understand looking out upon the wastes of deserts we see what man does to the beauties of the earth little by little he corrupts them he destroys the beautiful valleys and puts factories in their places he destroys the wonderful mountains and digs out of them the metals he uses to make atomic bombs everywhere man is untrue to the earth he does not cherish he does not love the earth mother as he should he does not realize that he is blessed in being able to live upon the surface of the bounty of the infinite and that if he behaved himself and regarded his life properly he could have all that he needs as long as he lives but selfishness, cupidity, conflict creep in and little by little the earth that should be a magnificent garden becomes another phase of punishment so it's therefore everywhere we can we should be trying to release ourselves from the misuse of our own possessions the misrepresentation of our own ideas and the gradual corruption of policies that as they go take with them all that is worth living for and leave nothing behind in the next few months maybe a year or two we're going to have some very important decisions we're going to have to make socially we're going to have to face the difficulties arising from the exhaustion of resources available for corruption we are going to realize that we cannot corrupt more without bringing down the whole structure that we have gone as far as wit can go and it is time for wisdom to come in we have gone as far as our skill can take us and now what we need is our heart to lead us out of all of this there must come a tremendous sense of beauty a tremendous sense of release of consciousness it is time for us to develop the mystery of finding the higher sense for our souls unless we do we are going to bring down to ruin one of the most wonderful structures that nature has ever produced we are just part of a great system we cannot break the rules of the system without suffering now today we are looking for answers but these answers can never succeed unless these answers are accepted by individuals laws can never make us perfect legislation can never heal the wounds of crime the only thing that can bring peace to this world is the release of soul power the power within the individual to love to forget and to forgive these have to be there and out of this regeneration of motives this reorganization of principles this redemption of a way of life we can go into the new century with peace and security but if we do not make these adjustments they will go on and on until finally the waters of oblivion close over the great mistake which we have called humanity and there's no reason it has to be a mistake it is being tested always and as long as there is one big grain of hope left nature will work with us nature can t take a little more take a little more punishment it can make a few more adjustments but unless the, the motion towards solution begins to appear and unless we stop trying to build upon something that is itself soulless we will be in trouble the school teacher has a conscience and also has a wonderful psychic integration as all of us have the school teacher has a soul but the system will not permit that soul and if the school teacher tries to teach it will lose its job if the individual who tries to do an honest day's work succeeds they will probably be penalized by the union whatever happens the way we live now we have created a system of despotism which prevents us from the expression of our own integrity but in the deeper is something that cannot die 
as Paracelsus pointed out, the elixir of transmutation within each person is the power to transmute every mistake he makes into soul power. In a society, there is a possibility that every nation that has done it badly can by a transmutation a very mystery of uh, t- transformation uh, can take the evils and the mistakes and change them into soul growth we grow by our mistakes but we have to recognize these mistakes and prevent ourselves from continuing them forever if we do it right and do it beautifully and do it quite kindly we will come out all right but in the meantime there's a possibility of everybody having a little fun out of it there are things we can do that will be pleasant for us we can find new joys with our children we don't have to wonder what they're doing if we, if we continue as we do now we'll never find out what they're doing they will destroy themselves and others everywhere there is a need for restoration of integrity the churches are attempting it there's no question about that the churches are making several adjustments they're beginning to think in terms of a church that looks like a church and that's the first step the second thing is good church music actually there is more religion in an old-fashioned hymn than there is in all of the modern sophisticated music one of the reasons being the old hymn they all know they all sing it together and it reminds them all of days that were better these things are very important they help the soul to be free but to be free it must unite with other souls it must share with them they must sing together work together play together and if necessary die together but in all these experiences soul growth continues this beautiful golden light inside of ourselves this wonderful star of eternal salvation that shines in our own hearts will never go down and never disappear as long as we try as long as we make every effort we can to improve to grow to share and to create a better world as long as we make these efforts things will go better and they are coming now I can see every day more and more the, the discouragement that is in the minds and hearts of those who are failing I can see the discouragement in the minds of the legislators who are trying and knowing before they start that they cannot succeed by the forces they are taking there is no way in which the present problem can be solved without integrity and there is no way in which we can share integrity until it comes through the people and not to them it must be part of a new program of recognizing once more the joy of the family the joy of good friendship the joy of firm and permanent marriages the firm and the of children who love their parents all these superficial things will work out all right if we get a few of the major principles firmly in our consciousness keep them there and live them every day to the best of our ability thank you